Hello, welcome to my channel Bite Size Law. This is the first of four videos for law students focusing on interests which override under the Land Registration Act 2002, Schedule 3, Paragraph 2. Schedule 3, Paragraph 2 is a long provision, so I'm going to break it down into bite sized pieces to make it easier for you to follow. So, in the first two videos, I'm going to take you through the statute step by step and show you how, by following the wording of the statute, you can produce an answer to a problem style question with a clear and logical structure. I'm also going to take you through a worked example using a technique known as the IRAC method, which is another effective way of producing an answer with a logical structure. So in this video, I'm going to take you through the first part of the statutory provision, the general rule, and in the second video, I'm going to be looking at the exceptions to the general rule. In the third video, I'll be pointing out some common mistakes students make and give you advice on how to avoid them. Finally, in the fourth and last video, I will take you through my plan to an answer to the sample exam question to show you how Schedule 3, Paragraph 2 fits into a question on third party rights on registered title. Finally, please watch all the videos in sequence as they are all linked. So here's the text of Schedule 3, Paragraph 2. And the first thing you might have noticed is that Paragraph A is missing. This is because I've removed all the paragraphs which are not relevant to third parties who are in occupation and are claiming that they have an interest which overrides under paragraph two. So let's start to break it down into bite-sized pieces. And the first thing to understand is that it breaks down into two main parts. There is a general rule highlighted in pink, which I'm going to discuss in this video. And there are a number of exceptions which I've highlighted in green and which I'm going to discuss in the second video. So here is a quick summary of Schedule 3, Paragraph 2. There's a general rule and then there are a number of exceptions. And this is very common for legal principles, so you've probably come across it many times previously. So now let's start to break down the general rule into bite-sized pieces. So there are two requirements. The first is that the third party must have an interest. And in reality, you're going to be dealing with an equitable interest here. Because if you have a third party with a legal interest, then you should be dealing with it under a different statutory provision. Also note that the courts have interpreted the word interest to mean a proprietary interest. So the third party must have an interest which is more than simply a personal right in the land. So a personal license to occupy the land, for example, would not fall within the general rule and so wouldn't override. The second requirement is that the third party must occupy the land over which they have the interest they're claiming overrides. Now, there are lots of cases on how you determine whether a third party is in, in actual occupation or not, but I'm not going to go through them in any great detail with you here because I want to concentrate on the wording of the statute. However, when I go through the sample exam question, I will give you some basic pointers and show you how I've applied them to the facts of the question. I've also put some of the key cases on the next slide. So they are the two requirements and the statute states that they must be present at the time of the disposition, which in most cases will mean when the property is sold. So here are a few of the key cases on the general rule. Link lending and busted is my personal favourite on how the courts have dealt with the issue of occupation because it contains a really good discussion of the relevant factors to apply. You may have noticed that the Williams and Glynn's Bank and Bolan case is a pre-Land Registration Act 2002 case, but it's still an important case and remains good authority today. Also notice that this case is authority that a minor interest can also have overriding status for third parties in occupation. And I'll cover this point in the fourth video. 
So here's a summary of what we've seen so far. There are two requirements. The third party must have a proprietary interest, which in reality will be an equitable interest. And the third party must be in occupation and they both must be present at the time of the disposition, which is usually a sale. And it's important to appreciate that if either of these are missing at the time of the disposition, then there's no interest which overrides under Schedule 3, Paragraph 2. On the next slide, I'm going to introduce you to the facts of a sample exam question. But before I do that, I just want to point out that I'm making a couple of assumptions. The first one is fairly obvious. I'm assuming that you've been told that title to the property is registered. So you're not dealing with land where title is unregistered. And secondly, I'm assuming that the only thing that you are discussing here is the possibility of an interest which overrides under Schedule 3, Paragraph 2. Now, in reality, this will probably form part of an answer on third parties who are occupying land with registered title. So in the fourth video, I'm going to take you through my plan for a complete answer so you can see how this issue fits into the wider answer. So here are the facts of the specimen question and you might want to hit the pause button so that you've got time to read them. And I will be using the yellow door scenario in later videos too. So the first thing to notice is that the examiner hasn't given us any clue or instructions about what Boris requires advice on. So the first thing I'll do before I launch into a detailed explanation of interest which override is that I would tell the examiner what the main issue is. So here is the main issue, or the big picture, which is, does Teresa, who's the third party, have an interest in Yellow Door? And if so, does that interest take priority over the sale to Boris? On this slide, I've identified the key facts for you. And the facts in red relate to whether Teresa has an interest in Yellow Door. And the facts in pink we're going to use to decide whether Teresa was in actual occupation of Yellow Door at the time of the sale. As I mentioned earlier, I like to use the IRAC method as much as I can because it helps to produce a clear and logical structure to your legal argument. And it's a really good technique and I would recommend that you use it for all problem style questions in law assessments. IRAC stands for Issue, Rule, Application and Conclusion. So we've explained the main issue and now we need to explain the law in more detail. And remember that we're only looking at Schedule 3, Paragraph 2 in this example. So the issue is whether Teresa has an interest which overrides the sale to Boris under Schedule 3, Paragraph 2. And we start by looking at the general rule and we will deal with each requirement in turn. So the first issue is, does Teresa have an interest? And the rule decided by the courts is that the interest must be a proprietary interest. So the issue becomes, did Teresa have a proprietary interest in Yellow Door? Now, the rule that I applied is taken from Lloyds Bank and Rossett, which is that a non-legal owner will acquire a beneficial interest in land if they contribute towards the purchase price. So when we come to apply that rule to the facts, well, we can say that Teresa contributed £50,000 towards the purchase price of Yellow Door, and we can then conclude that Teresa did have a proprietary interest in Yellow Door at the time of the disposition. Now, if you watch all my videos on this particular topic, you'll see that in video four, that in fact, you will have already dealt with this point earlier in your answer. So I'd strongly recommend that you look at all the videos in the series, particularly the last video. So the second part of the general rule is that the third party must be in actual occupation at the time of the disposition. Now, I'm sure that you'll have spotted when you're reading through the facts that Teresa hadn't been living with Jeremy for the six weeks immediately prior to the sale. 
So we need to make it clear to the examiner that we have spotted what the issue is here. And students very often just jump straight into a discussion about the cases on what actual occupation means without really making it clear why they're doing it. So you can improve your answer by explaining what the issue is. And the issue is, does Teresa's temporary absence prevent her from being in actual occupation? Now, as I explained earlier, I'm not going to go through all the cases on actual occupation with you in this video series. But to summarise, the courts will look at the type of land that you're dealing with. They will look to see whether the absence is likely to be permanent or temporary. And they will also look to see if there's any evidence of an intention to return to the property. So when we apply those factors to this scenario, well, it's residential property. We know that the absence was temporary because the purpose of the absence was to visit her mother and that it was for a relatively short period of time. So it's only for six weeks. And we also know that there is some physical evidence at the property that she intended to return because she left her personal belongings at Yellow Door. So the conclusion that we can reach on this particular issue is that Teresa was in actual occupation at the time Boris purchased Yellow Door. So our final conclusion in relation to the general rule is that potentially Teresa does have an interest which will override the sale to Boris. And the reason that I've said potentially has an interest which would override is because the next stage would be to consider whether any of the exceptions to the general rule applies. And that's what I'm going to be looking at in the next video. So just to remind you what we've done, we've just completed looking at the general rule. And what I'm going to move on into the next video is looking at the exceptions to the general rule. Thank you for watching. And if you find this video and the other videos in my series helpful, I'd be really grateful if you'd subscribe to my channel or like or share the videos because it really does make a difference.